This is our fourth and final session on Philippians 2, 25 to 30. And I simply want to ask one thing about this phrase right here. Epaphroditus was indeed ill, we're talking about him, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me. So he, he, he saved him from dying. He healed him. Lest, and this would mean lest if Epaphroditus had died, I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Father, as we ponder this phrase, you're sparing Paul sorrow upon sorrow. Help us to know how to apply that to ourselves because there are many sorrows. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read the whole thing. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. That's how sick he was. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also. Paul loved him. To lose him would have been hard. Lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So, receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, my question is this, or let's just make two observations. One, if God is the one who actually healed this sickness, which he is, then he could have prevented the illness in the first place, right? If God has the power over disease, to push back a cancer or to push back pneumonia or kidney failure. He has the power to stop it from developing in the first place. And so we need to keep that in mind when we see God's sparing Paul sorrow upon sorrow. Here's the second observation. When he says, he prevented me from having sorrow upon sorrow. What are we to make of that? Since Paul did have sorrow upon sorrow, though the death of Epaphroditus was not one of them. For example, chapter 1, verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that I, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He's in prison. There's a sorrow. Or verse 17, the former preacher, kind of preachers, proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. He's got people preaching the gospel to afflict him. That's a sorrow. Chapter 2, verse 20, I have no one like Timothy who will be genuinely concerned for their welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. His, his fellow workers were letting him down with selfishness. That's a sorrow. So when he says, God spared me sorrow upon sorrow, when he could have prevented the illness in the first place, could have prevented any of these sorrows, and he didn't. What are, we to, what are we to make of this? God spared me one more sorrow. Here's a text that I think sheds light on how God works. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation. And the word temptation in the New Testament and the word test are the same. You don't have to think of every temptation as a sexual temptation or a temptation to steal. It might be a temptation to curse God when you're sick. Anything that would threaten your faith is a test and a temptation. No temptation has overtaken you 
but what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tested. He won't let He won't let a sorrow pile upon another sorrow beyond your ability. But when but with the test, the temptation, the test, he will provide the way of escape in the sense that you will be able to endure it. So it seems to me that what this is saying is when sorrows start to mount up, sorrow, sorrow, sorrow in your life, God knows what you can endure and you should cry out to him for relief and he will hear your prayer and only allow to come into your life what is good for you. Here's an example from 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this thorn in the flesh that it would leave me. And it, it didn't along with all the other things Paul had to deal with. There was this thorn. But Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient. That's the meaning of, I won't allow. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. His grace is sufficient for you. His power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So my conclusion from this is that, yes, God has the power both to heal from sickness and to prevent, prevent it in the first place. The sickness was hard enough on Paul and Epaphroditus. Death would have been very hard on Paul. And so God spares him that. He, he knows, I've pushed Paul now as far as I'm going to push him in bringing into his life those experiences where he has to cling to me and doesn't have any resources in himself to handle. God knows what is best for us, and we must trust him, which is what Paul did as he cried out for help and accepted what Paul gave, I mean, what God gave. One last observation. Here's the main point of the text. He's telling them, receive him now, receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with joy and honor such men. What men? What such? What kind of men? Men who, when they get sick, don't grumble. Remember that from 2.14? Men who trust God's sovereign goodness that he will not allow any more sorrows to pile up on us then he will give us grace to make us sufficient for. And three, live for for others. That's what such men are. Such men as Epaphroditus, he didn't grumble, he trusted God's sovereign goodness, and he poured out his life for Paul and for the Philippians, and when such men are honored, God is honored, and people are loved.